Cool. Well, it's a privilege to be part of the Crossroads community um, and to be here in Cincinnati. I love living in Cincinnati. Um, Psalm 90 um, ends with a plea that grabbed my attention 10 years ago. It says, May the work of the Lord appear before your servant. Establish the work of my hands, O Lord. Establish the work of my hands. And I thought to myself, how much easier it would be if I was doing God's work, following him, instead of asking God to bless my projects. Psalm 90 came to life to me in a book about Hudson Taylor, The Spiritual Secrets of Hudson Taylor, in chapter 14. In 1954, Hudson arrived in China as a 20-year-old with a goal to bring the gospel to the people of China. Like most entrepreneurs, his startup was bumpy. After 15 years, Hudson was worn out and discouraged. He wrote to his friends, how can I preach the power and the peace of Christ if I don't feel it myself? I got this right. In 1969, Hudson had his awakening. He wrote his sister, instead of a puny branch trying to suck the sap from the vine of Christ, I now see myself simply as an extension of the vine. The vine is God himself, subject to no limitations, unlimited resources. If I am in Christ, can Christ be rich and me poor? Can the right hand be rich and the left hand poor? I am no longer anxious about anything because Christ can carry out his will and his will is mine. It does not matter in what circumstances he places me, his resources are mine. Years later, a colleague wrote about Hudson this. He was an object lesson in quietness. Here was a 58-year-old man, about my age, bearing tremendous burdens, yet absolutely calm and untroubled. Oh, the pile of letters he read, anyone containing the news of death, lack of funds, riots. Yet all were answered in the same tranquility. Dwelling in Christ, he drew every farthing of his income from heaven. At 42 years old, I had exceeded in my American dream, managing partner of a large Silicon Valley venture fund. But there was no tranquility in my soul, and Hudson's object lesson in quietness became the object of my spiritual aspiration. And like Hudson, my heart was drawn to a place on the other side of the world. My place was Romania. But before God could use me in Romania, he needed to break me and rebuild me, which he did from 2004 to 2006 in Romanian mountain villages and in the homes of pastors persecuted during communism. And my eyes were open to a new truth, that the power of Christ comes solely from dependence on him. And my self-sufficiency was the polar opposite of dependence. By education, experience, relationships, and worldly success, created a sense of self-sufficiency in me that literally drained the power of the gospel from my life, like water leaking from a frozen pipe. And the largest single barrier between me and the power of the vine was the self-sufficiency and security I found in my money. So I handed all my money back to God. And his money has become the seed of new creations, startups, in healthcare, real estate, manufacturing, tourism, agriculture, digital media, and even a democracy movement in Romania. But this time, I was completely dependent on God because I didn't speak the language, I didn't understand the culture, and nobody understood the law. Prayer and meditation, which in America feel like a spiritual discipline we don't have time for, was the only practical source of hope I had with my treasure in Romania. Every Romanian told me I was nuts to invest in their country. They said, why are you trying to invest? We're all trying to leave. The system's rotten to the core, and you will get ripped off, you fool. But for the first time in my life, I chose love. I chose hope. I chose the foolishness of God above human reason. Exactly 10 years ago, in April 2006, Dave Peterson, a friend at Menlo Park Presbyterian Church, uh, gave me a blessing called Doing God's Work God's Way. He gave it to me because I told him I was going to invest my treasure in Romania. This blessing offers a very different approach to entrepreneurship. And as you'll hear today, it's been more fruitful than my wildest imaginations. The blessing begins 
with a familiar verse, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I bless you with knowing your purpose as God has seen it in his heart. Because as you experience the joy of fulfilling your purpose, you will benefit, others will benefit, and the world will be a better place. Today I'd like to share the rest of this blessing in six small pieces as I've experienced the wonder of becoming part of God's workmanship over 12 years and 106 transatlantic trips to Romania. Entrepreneurs, the blessing number one is that I bless you with a life-giving community to fit into. You have a piece to put into a mosaic because you can't do what God's called you to do alone. I bless you with finding like-hearted, like-spirited, and like-vision partners. So how do we know if we're doing God's work? I think the easiest way is to look around and see who's joined the team, because God has planted his work in the hearts of his people, and he unites those people into his enterprises. The TED Talk, Start With Why, is all about this. Great endeavors don't happen based on who raises the most money, hires the most employees quickest, and gets to market fastest. Great enterprises come from organizations that attract talented people united in the same mission. The first business lesson that God taught me in Romania was that he, not me, was the team builder. Steve Shellhammer and I started New Vista, our Romanian venture fund, with a vision to buy and compact hundreds of pieces of fallow farmland to create some of the most beautiful spaces in Europe. Surprisingly to Steve and I, um, many Americans asked if they could invest. At first we said no, but after a year we said you can invest if you come to Romania. And amazingly, 25 American families had vested in our fund without any idea what we would do on our land. Blessing number two, your father will bless you with the right closed doors. The enemy will try to get you to do things that God has not designed for you. Good things, legitimate things, honorable things, profitable things, but your father has not designed them for you. The question most, most entrepreneurs ask me is, what do you think about the market opportunity? And my response is, the question isn't the market opportunity. The question is whether God designed this opportunity for you. When we started New Vista, everyone was trying to convince me to build multi-unit apartments, which had a tremendous return on investment because demand was so great to escape the communist blocks. But there was nothing godlike about crowding a bunch of people into unplanned farmland with no infrastructure, no roads, no parks. What seemed godlike was helping a retired pastor whose family lost everything during communism buy land in the village he was raised in. Everyone thought I was nuts. But we saw the ability to turn this very inexpensive land into Romania's greatest economic resource. Wide open spaces of beautiful, fertile, water-rich, carbon-free land, an increasingly scarce global resource. Today we're developing the first planned community in Eastern Europe with new business models in sourcing food, water management, education, and abundant parkland to walk and breathe the cleanest air in Europe. We are complying with the 2020 EU directive for almost net zero energy construction, providing Romanians freedom from the post-communist bureaucracy that still sucks the life out of their individual creativity. We can't recreate the Garden of Eden, but we can try and cherish what God's created for us and still exist in Romania. Blessing number three. I bless you with being in your father's time, not running ahead, not lagging behind. Because doing his will in the right time, with the right place, the right way, with the right people alongside of you. God's work's like an oak tree, built slowly with deep roots, and it lasts for generations. Human work is like a mushroom, with no roots and a quick exit. God's work always involves more patience than we think. Timing is probably the biggest factor that dooms startups. Most are too early, some are too late. Most of my failures when I was in the venture business with Delphi Ventures were in startups that invested aggressively in a growth plan and ran out of money before the market developed. But I don't think God scripts aggressive growth plans. 
what God writes is a people plan. And I think God signals his timing in your business based on when he brings the right people. In 2013, we started Press One, one of Romania's first independent media companies. I immediately scurried, like in my old VC self, to find an experienced editor. But my partner, Voiku, rested. Voiku was determined to wait on an experienced editor who had never taken a bride and written a lie, which is really hard in a country where corrupt oligarchs own the media. In 2015, after two years of waiting, God, God called Miknia, one of the country's most respected editors, to Press One. Soon, many talented young journalists followed Miknia to Press One. In the first six months, over a million Romanians have experienced the fresh air of honest, positive, honest journalism. It's frustrating to wait on God when you see a need and have money in your pocket, but it's better to run lean and allow God to bring the right people into your business at the right time. Blessing number four, God has uniquely designed you as an instrument of a particular set of good deeds that you can do better than anyone else. I asked entrepreneurs two questions when I first meet them. Are you doing a good deed that won't get done unless you do it? And secondly, how is this idea woven into your nature? Startups face crushing disappointments and endless skepticism. And when this happens, business people, creatures of logic, find another job. When this happens, bad entrepreneurs, dreamers, quit and chase another dream. But great entrepreneurs are forces of nature. They regroup and find a better way. But if you need to be forces of nature, it's important to understand what shapes your nature. For me, I grew up in Frankfurt, Germany in the 1970s, 30 years after World War II. From the eyes of a curious teenager, I remember that Italians were German cleaning ladies who always stole from you. I remember Americans lived in big houses, drove nice cars, and had the newest Adidas soccer shoes. Germans lived in little houses, drove mopeds, and played with worn-out tennis shoes. Those years in the 1970s in Germany gave me a conviction that recovery takes two generations, and that stupid false stereotypes do, in the end, fall away, as they're now falling away about Romania. The other thing is that I began investing in Silicon Valley before the internet browser. And it became my nature to know that great investments always begin as inexplicable ideas that no one understands. And it became my nature to know that great returns have holding periods of more than a decade. These unique experiences embedded into my being gave me a conviction and perseverance that few, maybe nobody, had about making long-term investments in Romania. Blessing number five. I bless you with being fully present in today's grace, in today's assignment. The moment I read Dostoevsky's Image of Christ in Brothers Karamazov, I never forgot the words. He walked quietly with a gentle smile and eyes of infinite compassion. That image of Christ became the ideal of the man I wanted to be in the workplace. Before every meeting now, for years, I pray for the patients to look people in the eye and in some small way make sure they feel valued. I try to walk in the shoes of others as we sit in meetings, working through the tasks. God does not make his appeal to the world through our products and services. It's through our relationships. And I'm convinced that living in the present moment, focusing on today's assignments, not worrying about tomorrow, is the greatest efficiency effort in avoiding wasted thoughts, and wasted work. And finally, the final blessing. Your Father intends for you to carry the fragrance of heaven, for people to be attracted to you. But it won't be because you're effective or competent or secure, but because you have the perfume of Christ. In November 2014, I've gotten carried away here and skipped some of these here, I was afraid I would do this. Um, in November 2014, driving down 71 here, a Romanian NGO called me to do a get out the vote video in the presidential campaign. I drove to a friend's studio in Covington. We posted a short video on our Romanian One YouTube channel. The video instantly went viral in a stunning pol 
political outcome. The candidate who won overcame a 20-point deficit in the polls in seven days. Suddenly, I became a public figure in Romania and was asked to speak around the country. A year ago, in 2015, a fire needlessly killed and seriously burned 200 young Romanians in a club called Collectif. Everything about the building was illegal. Four days after the fire on November 3rd, I flew from Cincinnati to Bucharest, and walking down to my hotel, I encountered thousands of people getting into the street to start a demonstration. So I helped block some cars and entered the street. Soon there were thousands in the street. As I stood on this grassy knoll in Piazza Universitate, I heard dozens of people screaming my name. I had no idea who they were. After an hour, I went to my hotel room and noticed hundreds of missed calls and texts on my mobile phone. It turned out that Pro TV, the evening news, was using my face as the face of the demonstration, repeating me dozens of times in a seven-second video. These texts from Romanians said, thank you for believing me, thank you for encouraging me, thank you for speaking up, and thank you for not being scared. I was dumbfounded. Why me, I said in my hotel room. Why are people attracted to me? I've done some pretty stupid things in my life. Why me on TV? Why did I end up in the streets? Why have so many Americans entrusted their money to me in a country they know little about? And why did I feel in this moment so fully alive? Experiencing the earth-shaking power of tens of thousands of peaceful people finally recognizing their self-worth. Lying in my hotel room, I wept as the hours went by from 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, I thought of the day 25 years ago in the glow of post-communism enthusiasm that democracy died in this exact same spot when the Romanian government ordered 10,000 miners wielding rebar poles to beat thousands of pro-democracy demonstrators, many to their death. Now 50,000 Romanians in the street, the silent majority of this beautiful culture had finally been awakened and said, hell no corruption. I invested in Romania 10 years ago because I knew this day would come, but I had no idea how or when it would happen. I had no idea that the Romanian anti-corruption effort would convict over a thousand politicians and judges and put them in jail. I had no idea that the 60,000 Romanians would fight along Americans in Iraq and Afghanistan, and that Romania would become not only the most pro-American country in Europe, but America's most trustworthy ally in military, anti-terror, cybersecurity, drug enforcement. I had no idea that human tragedy would finally awaken the silent majority of Romanians. I had no idea how God would redeem the freedom and dignity of Romanians, but I knew he would. The next morning, the newspaper ran this headline. The system is shaking, cracking, sizzling in the burning flames of a corrupt, lying, venal, greedy political system. The revolution of the Romanian conscience finally exploded through the only unlocked door of a burning club, Collective. Going forward, we will live a different life because Collective is and will remain from now on the accumulation of everything that is wrong in politics and in Romania. By the afternoon, the Prime Minister and all 26 ministers in the government had resigned. After being lied to, lied about, stolen from, threatened, jailed, beaten, kicked, and spit on, the spirit within Romanians had finally overcome the evil in this world. In 2016, Romania is widely regarded as the most stable and attractive place in Eastern Europe. The foolishness of God in 2006, when I invested my treasure, has become human wisdom in 2013. I'll close with a line that we know from Matthew, Luke, and John. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. If I had not invested most of my net worth in Romania, I probably would not have found the courage to chase illegal loggers, 
unlock the mystery of where my taxes were being spent, or become an anti-corruption crusader. I've learned where you and me invest our treasure is how we affect the world around us. And I close with two thoughts. For investors, like me, do an asset allocation model with just two asset classes. One's building the kingdom, and the other is called fortifying worldly principles. Take a look at every equity, security, and bond that you own and put them in one of these two classes, and you'll see where your heart really lies. And for entrepreneurs, as you demo your product, share your marketing strategy, and pitch investors, have the heart of a servant, servant because people don't really care what you know until they know you really care about them. I posted this blessing on my blog. I've got a website, donlothrop.com, if any of you want to read it in its entirety and share it. And um, I'll close, and, and maybe some Romanians here can offer the final word. Um, but I'll close by saying tomorrow is Good Friday in Romania. Hundreds of Romanians are watching this right now. And to the Romanians, I love you. I miss you. And Christos a Andriat. Christ is risen indeed. That's always the final word. Thank you. That was beautiful. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.